Okay, my name is Kate Bullard. I'm a project organizer for the Adjunct Action Network. Um, and this is part of a series of conversations that the network has done featuring prominent voices in the adjunct movement. For those who aren't aware, Adjunct Action is the adjunct outreach arm of the Service Employees International Union. And the Adjunct Action Network is a member-driven effort to raise the standards in higher education and in the teaching profession. Our philosophy is that the more people we reach, the more change will affect. Our guest today is Sarah Kenzior, who is a former adjunct and a writer for the Chronicle of Higher Education and Al Jazeera English. We're going to be talking today about adjunct issues in general, but really emphasizing the experiences of women who are 62% of the adjunct workforce, even though they're actually only one out of every three full professors. So welcome, Sarah. Uh, it's good to see you. We have a lot of questions uh, from our viewers. Is there anything you want to say right away, just to kind of? No, I'm happy to go range questions. Okay, great. All right. So what I've done for those of you who submitted questions um, is I've sort of compressed things together. So if you don't hear your exact question, you know, just be aware of that. So maybe first for people who maybe aren't as familiar. Um, what would you say some of the specific challenges women face in higher education that might explain why women end up as adjuncts more frequently? Well, I think a lot of it is an economic issue. I mean, there are some basic issues that affect every woman in any kind of workforce, um, you know, of respect um, and, you know, kind of a perception of a woman's value. But in terms of academia, uh, the way the career path is structured requires you to have a lot of flexibility in your geographic location. Um, kind of assumes that there's going to be the ability to move from place to place, um, to work unpaid, to research unpaid, um, or to work for very little money. And a lot of women are entering graduate school at the exact same time that they are trying to, you know, have families, raise children, and they have other responsibilities and other, you know, financial obligations to meet. And so I think that, um, you know, the inability to kind of move around and just, you know, live as a person solely supporting yourself instead of supporting others uh, hinders the ability of women to advance in the workforce. That's not the fault of the women, that's the fault of the way that the higher education um, career track is structured. Mm -hmm. So for you, do you think, I mean, I, I think obviously there are parallels with other professions, but do you think, I mean, do you think higher education in particular is worse? Because of the, the fact that you're coming out of a PhD program often during key childbearing years or, or those kinds of reasons? Yeah, and then, you know, there's also a, an attitude towards motherhood um, in higher ed. You know, then this is not also unique to higher ed, but, you know, you definitely see it there. Where women are discouraged, um, you know, from kind of, from either having children or at least kind of admitting uh, the difficulties or um, struggles or needs they have, uh, you know, as mothers working in an academic community. I don't think that there's, you know, any shame in having children or that there's any reason for women to not just be upfront about these dual identities. I mean, that's just life and, you know, and men don't necessarily have to, um, you know, face the same difficulties. I think in any profession um, that has to do with kind of caring for others or helping others, there's a sense that you should be willing to sacrifice a lot of yourself um, just for the sheer benefit of being part of that, um, you know, part of that project, part of that way of helping people. You know, you see this in, um, you know, in nursing, um, in child care, and in education, and in any field where you're looking after, you know, somebody younger, helping somebody younger than yourself. And so I think that, um, you know, women have fallen into that role of underpaid caretaker many times and uh, that's also something that happens in higher education despite the fact that you know these are adults teaching other adults. Mm -hmm. I thought, uh, you know, I think that's really interesting this idea of shame. Um, the piece that you wrote in the Chronicle where you talked about your own decision to have children in graduate school and the way that people reacted, um, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. That's something Maybe not everyone has read, but at least for me, I, I found it really powerful. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, when I started graduate school, I was pretty sure I was going to have kids in graduate school. And I was fine with that. I actually thought it made a lot of sense because, you know, you have a more flexible schedule. I had a good stipend where I was. My husband has a job. I was like, you know, this will be good. I can, you know, raise children and I, you know, will be 
employed, whereas if I had a, you know, a quote, real job, I would either have to quit or put the kid in daycare or figure this out. So I thought, well, this makes sense. The way people responded was to just, you know, I mean, there, there are a bunch of problems. One was there's this idea that I, I needed permission to do this, either, you know, in an informal way, a sort of belonging to my social environment, but also literally permission. Like, people would be like, did your chair you know, tell you that this is okay, and I'm like, you know, he's the chair of my dissertation, not my uterus, and so, you know, I got pregnant the first year, had my child in the summer between my first and second year, people kind of assumed it was an accident, they assumed I might drop out, you know, none of that happened, I, I was fine, you know, I, I had wanted to do this, and I liked my work, I, you know, loved my children, and things were cool. Then I got pregnant again, um, right around the time that I was writing my dissertation, and again, this was fine, because when you write your dissertation, you have a pretty flexible schedule. So, you know, this shouldn't really be an issue. You know, if anything, it depends very much on, you know, what your particular circumstances are. But graduate school can be a good time to have a child. But the the way you're treated, it doesn't matter how much you're you accomplish. It doesn't matter what you publish or what you think. You you are seen as a mother. Um, I think this affects men too, but I think especially if, you know, you are pregnant and you're having children, just your visibility, you know, as a pregnant woman, as a woman carrying an infant, as a woman who occasionally needs to take breaks to nurse it, you know, to nurse your child, like, that creates a perception of you as more of a body, you know, than a mind, and, and that's, um, you know, other people witness that, and I think that that may, uh, you know, change some women's minds about having kids in, in graduate school, just that perception alone. So how do we go about fighting that? I mean, maybe this is something, you know, what did you do in that situation? How do you kind of fight that sense that you, you're reduced to a mother or that is, that is your sole identity or you're not taken seriously as a result? How do you think we, we start to kind of push back against that? I mean, you know, I was just living my life, and so at the time I certainly didn't think, like, I, I'm being, like, an activist or a force to be reckoned with on this issue. I just, that's what I wanted to do, and I did it. Um, you know, I would encourage any woman to just do what they want to do, and, you know, and that includes women who, who feel like they're being pressured into having children when they don't want to. I just think, you know, we should all just do what we want. The one thing I think we should stop doing is apologizing for our decisions, because these are decisions of our personal lives. They have, you know, often no bearing on our professional ability. You know, I, I published many articles. I finished my dissertation before anybody in my cohort. Things were fine. You know, I had confidence in my ability to do this, and it was irritating to me that, you know, other people would not have confidence in me when I hadn't done anything to demonstrate, um, you know, that they should. You know, at one point when I was pregnant the second time, I felt like I needed a maternity dress with, like, my CV on it to just be like, you know, come on, you know, I, I can do this. Other women can do this. We're fine. You know, you don't need to concern yourself. But um, unfortunately, I think it's, it's threatening in a strange way. You know, you feel... Um, not powerless, but you know, pregnancy is tough. It's a tough thing to go through. It's tough to, to work and write while you're pregnant. So you always feel a little, you know, discombobulated. Whereas people see it as you're kind of somehow undermining the social order, which which I think is bizarre. You know, I think that women have to be there for each other. Um, I think we need to support each other, and I think we just need to, you know, take charge of our own decisions and and disregard the views of people who really have, um, you know, no no claim in weighing in on them. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the other issues that's gonna, that comes up for, for adjuncts is the question of maternity leave. Mm -hmm. um, for you, you said you had your children in the summer, and I know that's um, probably something a lot of people do. It's something I did. I had my children on semester breaks. Right. Um, but this is something that a, a couple of people wrote in about. What do we do about maternity leave? Because most adjuncts don't qualify for that. Right, yeah, I mean, that's one of the many health and uh, benefit issues that affect the adjunct community. I mean, pregnancy is just one. You know, I think that, again, that's something that needs to be pushed for collectively. I think that, you know, we need to stop apologizing for wanting things that, you know, people view as, uh, you know, entitlements but are, are just basic rights of the workforce. You know, there's an idea that you're not truly part of the workforce when you're adjuncting, um, you know, which is clearly erroneous because you're doing the exact same work as the full-time faculty. Uh, so, you know, I, I hope that that goes through. Um, I, I think men and women need to unite on this. I think paternal leave, you know, should also be an issue. Um, in my experience, graduate schools treat their uh, pregnant students better than universities treat their adjuncts on this. Um, they're given more rights and more 
freedom. So, you know, you would think it would kind of be the, the opposite. And I think that that's telling of the, the way that um, adjuncts are degraded in their workforce. Yeah, and I think, I mean, this is another issue where adjuncts have a lot in common with other low-wage workers, you know, that maternity and sick leave and taking care of your sick child you know, these are issues that all women face, especially, you know, women who can't afford to have an in-home nanny or, or anything of that nature to provide a cushion for them when they work. Right. And I'm sure... Yeah, I mean, you know, sorry, go on. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to agree with you that, you know, once again, this is not unique to, to higher education. I think there's just a, you know, a difference in kind of... Um, I don't know, the, the values accompanying it, the particular class of people accompanying it. Um, but yeah, you know, this is a general issue for any kind of low-wage uh, female employee. Right, right. Um, so I guess uh, one of the, the questions that somebody wrote in that I thought was particularly poignant, somebody wrote in who is a recent PhD, adjuncts, but has very little childcare outside of the actual teaching hours. So in terms of you know, doing research, all of the extra things that you have to do to get a full-time job, part of her sort of feels like maybe I should give up. Maybe I should leave the profession because, you know, it, it, it's so difficult for me to make a living. Right. Yeah, I mean, I would not know what to advise someone in that situation. <laughs> part of the problem with academia, you know, I, uh, people are always like, why do people adjunct, you know, and there are a million reasons, but I think one of the main ones that gets overlooked is that this is basically required of you if you did not get a tenure track job immediately upon graduation or you did not get a postdoc or something like that. You know, many mothers are in a position where they can't take postdocs, they can't take, you know, visiting positions, they can't afford to pay moving expenses and move their whole families around for years at a time, so they end up adjuncting. And the reason for that is to kind of stay in the game because if you step out, you know, even for a semester, people basically think, you know, this is someone who's not committed, this is not someone who's serious, whereas I think a lot of women are making that decision, you know, to step away out of uh, trying to maintain financial viability, trying to take care of their families. And so that's a very, um, that's a very tough call. I mean, I have, you know, left academia in the sense of I, you know, I no longer teach in a university, but I continue to do research, um, you know, in conjunction with universities. And if research is your goal over teaching, um, I think that as this becomes more ubiquitous, you know, very few graduate students go on to tenure track jobs. I think that there are certain programs and institutions that might be amenable to, you know, hiring you as a as a researcher in some kind of capacity. Like, I've continued doing work on um, Central Asia through George Washington University, um, you know, who funds part of some of my projects and brings me for talks. And it's nice to be kind of tangentially connected in that way and not, you know, have to give up um, the topic that, you know, I was immersed in then and, and am immersed in now. So there's a little more flexibility in the kind of non-traditional tenure track academic world. Well, and I think that also speaks to why women often end up as adjuncts rather than men, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And Graphic mobility is a huge issue. Yes. Yeah, I mean, that was one of the things, you know, I was thinking about as I was applying. It, it's geographic mobility in terms of, like, who can afford to just move their family around the country. A lot of these, you know, temporary positions, like a visiting position, pay very little, but are in somewhere like, um, you know, Harvard will pay you, like, 35000 or something, and then you have to somehow support your family of four in Cambridge. Like, you've got to be pretty wealthy to do that. You've got to have some kind of extra financial um, backing, and, you know, I, I personally didn't, and I think most people don't. And so that really narrows the pool of applicants in terms of who can continue on. You know, I know people, mothers of families um, who did that, you know, got their Ph.D., and then they adjuncted or they did visiting stuff for a couple of years and racked up phenomenal debt. You know, the debt is not only uh, in graduate school. The debt comes after graduate school. And that's one of the things that, that surprised me and that was most frustrating because, you know, I, I was very careful uh, in terms of debt. You know, I went to a very, you know, a school that gives a lot of funding in a very cheap city. You know, I felt like I was playing my cards right. It was just uh, the aftermath when I was expected you know, to work for like $10,000 a year, and then, which I was like, well, this is just not a possibility for me. Like, I, I don't have that kind of money. And 
you know, faculty at my school greeted that with bafflement. They were kind of like, well, what do you mean? Aren't you committed or can't you ask your parents? And I'm like, you know, listen, man, I'm like, you know, 32 years old. <laughs> like, I am a parent. I don't ask my parents for money, and my parents don't have money to give me. So there's a strange, you know, infantilization, you know, which I wrote about in the Chronicle that happens to graduate students where it's just, you know, it's like you're assumed to be a child who somebody is just going to pay your way around for your professional benefit, but you are an adult, you know, you're a teacher, you're often a parent. It, it, it's crazy. And Unfortunately, those who do have that kind of backing, I think, are the ones who benefit the most from this structure. You know, the other thing I thought was really interesting about that article was also this idea that graduate students are really infantilized, that they're encouraged to be subservient. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I think that is also what's really interesting about the adjunct movement in general, is that it's, it's saying to adjuncts, let's step out of that role and do something different. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think you need to, you know, a lot of people have written about this sense of internalized shame, you know, of powerlessness, and of sort of feeling like they, you know, deserve the pay they're getting, they deserve the low respect or social status they're getting. You know, I, I personally didn't quite experience that, but partly I have financial necessity because I was just like, well, this is just not an option, like the end, moving on. But I think for those who did it, I think it's understandable because, you know, academic culture is, is based on those feelings. Like, if people didn't feel that way, I, I don't think they would necessarily take these kind of um, jobs and accept these conditions. People want to be able to continue on that track, and they don't really have an option to forgo them. Um, but I do think that, of course, you know, adjuncts should see themselves as a professor like any other. I mean, we both know adjuncts write books, adjuncts publish papers. There's not this difference in talent or ability or even task. And it, the only real difference is in pay and status. And there's no reason for that difference to exist. So, you know, I, I'm happy to see that adjuncts are stepping up and fighting, um, you know, fighting for their rights and fighting for themselves because there's no justification for that kind of treatment. One of the other questions that someone wrote in about was this question of visibility, you know, this sense of shame that people feel that somehow they've done something wrong uh, and that's how they ended up as adjuncts. So oftentimes they don't want to identify themselves that way that they'd rather keep quiet, or they're afraid to step up and organize. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about, I mean, as someone who's also been involved in, in kind of activist movements in general, I mean, what would you say to somebody who's feeling that way? I mean, I think it's an understandable feeling because there is a stigma against adjuncts. You know, when you apply for a job, you know, there are some universities that, that will look down on that. You know, ignoring the fact that one's adjunct position you know, often has nothing to do with one's resume. It's an issue of money, an issue of circumstance, an issue of luck in a time where, you know, places get 900 applications for one job. Um, you know, I guess what I would just encourage people to, to remember is that they're far from alone or unique in this circumstance. And when so many talented people, you know, with proven um, abilities and long resumes are unable to find gainful employment, that's obviously, a, you know, the fall of the system and not the fall of the individual. And so, you know, I, I think it's good that in the last few years there's been so much writing on this issue. You know, sometimes it's frustrating to read that amount of writing because it's like a lot of the same arguments and plates over and over and, you know, not too much uh, change. But I do think it's important for people to not feel isolated because, you know, when I graduated in 2011, these issues were not talked about with that level of frequency. And I think it was a kind of private shame for people. You know, people talk about it in hushed tones. And so I'm glad the Internet, um, you know, has enabled people to speak to each other directly and to just be much more honest about what's going on. So you think that a lot of the reason there is less maybe or at least a pushback against that shame is the fact that people are connecting online and, and, and kind of reclaiming that title, you know, maybe having some pride in being an adjunct. Yeah, I think it's that. I think that, you know, generally speaking, the economy is bad. You know, higher education is far from unique. And I think all over people are expressing their frustrations. Um, I don't think that anything, you know, you and I are saying right now is like taboo or forbidden anymore. I think it's accepted as common knowledge. And the issue is more like, well, what are we going to do about it? You know, occasionally you find 
pushback, like that obnoxious letter that was in the Chronicle, you know, adjuncts stop whining. But I think even most tenure track um, faculty recognize that this is an issue. They see their own graduate students, you know, not being able to find jobs. You know, if you look at my own department where I graduated, well, don't look on the website because they leave out everybody who doesn't have a tenure track job, which means that they're basically not printing anybody's name anymore because, you know, this is a, a top research school and just th there aren't enough jobs. There are too many people, not enough jobs. And actually, let me restate that because there are plenty of jobs, there, but the jobs are adjunct jobs and they're not paying well. And so, you know, that's the issue that needs to be um, addressed because you do have professors. You don't have a glut of unemployed people, you have a glut of underemployed people. And so an easy way to, uh, you know, solve that problem is simply to increase wages. Right. I think, to me, what's also interesting about what you're saying is that for women in particular, sometimes working part-time or being geographically flexible is a choice. It's a choice that they want to make, that they want right. to be able to take care of their children. And so, you know, maybe we need to reframe those jobs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with working part-time. It's just that the wages are so ridiculous. Like, women don't, if you're an adjunct and you're teaching a course and you're getting paid like $2,500 and you're taking that time away from your children, you know, you are likely paying somebody to watch your kids and the cost of that can often outweigh the total that you make in a course. And I have known many mothers in that situation that just sort of see it as like, well, I do want to eventually get a tenure track job, so this is something I need to do. And so that adds up to debt. I mean, that's ridiculous. You know, these universities have money to spare. You know, they're building infrastructure. They have bloated administrative salaries. Those are easy places to just, you know, cut a little off the top and bring a little down to the bottom. And, you know, the teaching is the backbone of the university. That is why students are coming to school. They're not coming for fancy dorms or, you know, gourmet meals. You know, and, of course, this is this is – talking about a certain type of university and you know there are all sorts of different ones and many are, are hurting um, you know especially in light of the 2008 crisis and have lost their funding but generally speaking you know administrative salaries have been going up faculty adjunct salaries have been stagnating or, or going down and you know that's something that those are just you know a financial resource that needs to be reallocated mm hmm so I mean how do we how do we start to force that issue then? I mean, obviously, adjunct action is is part of SAIU, and ours is an organizing campaign to try to raise, excuse me, raise wages. But I think you're right. I mean, everybody sees this: tenured faculty, tenure track faculty, everybody right. happening. Parents. Yeah, well, parents is the one. I don't necessarily know if parents are as tuned in. I mean, the higher education community certainly knows everything that's happening and talks about it ad nauseum, but. You know, like, uh, my parents, for example, like, didn't know about any of this stuff until I started telling them. I think especially older generations, um, they just don't know. They, they see the tuition rising at such a rate, and I think there's an assumption that that money must be going to pay professors. I think they really don't assume that the money going to professors has been going down, because that's illogical, but of course the system itself is illogical. And so I think parents are a good group, um, parents and donors. Uh, to universities are a good group to approach with this and just sort of explain about the quality of education is declining. It's not that adjuncts are not good professors or don't do a good job, that anybody who's you know teaching four courses on four different campuses and shuttling around and in a constant state of stress about their financial situation is not going to be as good a professor as they could be were they given adequate pay. And so I think sort of um, portraying it to parents as a you know, you might not want to consider this college because this college is like 75% adjuncts and, you know, your child's professor might be gone the next year. They're not going to have a consistent community of faculty to guide them through their education. You know, these are all things that I don't really think most parents know, you know. Like, the issue is more on the radar than it has been, but, like, in terms of what people watch on the news, like, adjuncts aren't really leading the headlines. And so I think there should be more of a, an effort to reach out to just, you know, ordinary people um, who aren't following these debates much at all. Yeah, and I, I, I think there are ways to frame it so that it makes sense to people, you know, to connect it with other kinds of social justice issues. Right. Um, one person wrote in asking about women of color in the academy, which mm -hmm. are also, not just women of color, but people of color, color excuse me, are overrepresented among adjuncts. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, I'm not surprised yeah. by that just because there's a general culture of discrimination against people of color in academia that, you know, extends, I think, even to people who do get tenure track jobs. You know, like I've heard horror stories about mistreatment. You know, people have written about their mistreatment 
Um, I think that you know there's a, a tendency to to disrespect uh, professors of color. I think of them um, as less incompetent. Um, I think students often you know will have an attitude that they wouldn't necessarily have with a white professor. And so there are all these like broader issues um, you know to go to discuss when you're talking about that. But yeah, I mean, I think that the more disrespected and um, you know disenfranchised a person is in society in general, they're going to be showing up more and more in low wage work. And there's a cultural acceptance of that, you know, a social acceptance of like, oh well, this person should be working here, and you know, and I think that 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 just plays into racist assumptions. Yeah, and the the kind of isolation of adjuncts too makes it so you really have to push back with organizing in order to kind of overcome some of those issues. Yeah, I think organizing and then just open discussion and, you know, um, building these kind of collectives that have been growing over the last few years is, is the way to go. Yeah. Another question someone had was about the issue of sexual harassment, which is an issue, obviously, for women in lots of different professions. But I think in academia in particular, we've all seen situations where there has been someone who is well known as a sexual harasser but is accepted uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and protected often, and that mm -hmm. adjuncts are particularly vulnerable to that. Right, I mean, adjuncts are vulnerable in the way any, you know, uh, contingent faculty or contingent laborer is vulnerable because they, they lack the capacity to, you know, sue. They can be easily fired and then easily replaced. You know, the same thing has happened with um, interns and sexual harassment. You know, there's in, there have been uh, rulings, you know, that they can't sue for it. And so I think that's just another um, thing that people should fight for. You know, this isn't a, a topic that I'm that well versed in, but I definitely recommend um, Kate Clancy's work. She, she writes or used to write for Scientific American and it's done a formal study about um, sexual harassment in the field and so you know I'd urge people to check that out. Mm -hmm. I mean I think one of the, the main things and, and this is a theme not just for women but for adjuncts in general is really power. You mm -hmm. know the adjuncts are lacking in security, they're lacking in power and when you're isolated you are it's very easy to be subject to abuse. Yes I think that's true and then of course you're you're in this precarious position where you know you want to go higher. I mean, that's the thing. Like, I think sometimes people outside the academic you know circles, they're just sort of like, well, why are people putting up with all this stuff? Like, why not just do something else? And it's all kind of because people want to stay in, you know, to obtain this goal of job stability in a career that they love. And so they're willing to put up with a lot of crap. And I think we just have to, you know, accept that, you know. This is not necessarily a temporary position, one. And two, in a temporary position, you should not have to put up with the things that people are putting up with, you know, with, uh, you know, wages that sometimes go below minimum wage in terms of the hours work versus the pay years. And things like sexual harassment um, and discrimination against parents, a lack of benefits, lack of just sort of the basic uh, things that we used to expect in a workforce. And again, you know, academia is hardly unique. And, sort of systematically denying these things and just saying that, oh, that's the way it's always been or that's life, you know, those aren't, those aren't excuses that um, anyone should accept and they definitely are not things that people should be blaming themselves for, you know, this is a structural issue and, you know, you're not alone if you're suffering in these conditions. Yeah, and I, and I do think, you know, for women adjuncts in particular, it, there is a tendency to kind of say, well, you know, I decided to have a child, so then, or I decided to do this, so then that's, I, I have to suffer for it. Yeah, I, I mean, that attitude, I, I get it, but it's like, as women, we don't really decide when we have children. I mean, you have a window, you know, I mean, if, if you're adopting, obviously that's different, but like, I don't think that it's this, something so basic as having a child, as being a mother, should be this sort of, entitled action that you need to fight and that you need to prove you're worthy of having. You know, it's not like a luxury product. Like you're building a life, you're building your family. You know, this is your family and you shouldn't have to argue um, that the existence of your family is validated. One other question we had was a question about mentoring. I think this is something a lot of women struggle with in many professions. It's finding a mentor to help them navigate those issues, mm -hmm. family, geography. Did you have somebody, as you were going through your graduate program, uh, you know, especially a woman who you could sort of say, well, what am I, what should I do now? No, I mean, I've, I've never really had a mentor of any kind. Like, I, I hear a lot of this, like, mentoring 
stuff. I mean, I think some of this is just like my disposition. Like I'm a fairly independent worker. Um, I didn't. I wasn't necessarily looking for a mentor. I would have appreciated if there had been a female faculty that had had my back while I was pregnant. You know, I knew um, there were male faculty who were, you know, joking about taking bets on how long it would be until I dropped out. And just to sort of have someone to kind of, you know, I don't know, so support me during that would have been appreciated. I didn't have that. I kind of fell on my own. You know, later on, um, a couple other graduate students got pregnant and turned to me, and I tried to just, you know, give them the kind of advice and support that I didn't really have. You know, by that point, you know, my support network was was other mothers of St. Louis outside the academic community. You know, like, and that's actually something I would really recommend for pregnant graduate students is, you know, don't limit your social contacts to your department. Like make friends with other mothers, you know, make friends with people in your neighborhood, in your community, because that will be your backbone um, no matter what happens to you professionally. You know, those friendships don't depend on, you know, what your social position is in your department. And, and they also, they're not going to think, oh, you're crazy for having a baby. They're just going to be right. like, yeah, you know, you're a mom. Like, so am I, big deal. You know, all those things got yeah. the window. So I really, I really recommend that because I did have women friends in my community who supported me just as a mother and my identity as an academic was second, and I was fine with that. And I think that's an important point. Unfortunately, we have to wrap up. Thank you to everyone for joining us, and Sarah especially, thank you very much. And thank you for um, having me. One quick reminder, the Adjunct Action Network is uh, member-driven, so please head over to adjunctaction.com to join the effort. Thank you very much.